بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Dear friends, dear students, nice to be with you guys again. I've kind of, for some reason, I enjoy coming to Imperial. I've been here, I think this is probably my fourth or fifth time, I can't remember. Uh, probably predates your entry here. Um, several years ago, started several years ago. But I've always found the crowd to be a bit mature. So, I mean, I guess it must reflect maybe whatever the case is. So may Allah bless you because uh, it's a... Uh, it's a nice experience and uh, I think the last talk that I gave here was about Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak uh, Rahimahullah, it's, uh, I mean, for me personally it was extremely inspiring and uh, a lot of the time, depending on where you are it makes a difference as to what you're able to say because I believe that whatever we say comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's nice to be in your midst I know there's one of you at least that is supposed to be in Forest Gate at this time Right, but for some reason he's still in Imperial College. He's supposed to be in Forest Gates. I hope he doesn't get in trouble. Um, so let's start our talk. To start the talk today, I think what's important to understand first is that when we're covering a biography, then the whole point of covering a biography is so that we can learn something from it. We can hopefully relate to it. There are a huge number of individuals and luminaries and role models, exemplars in our history that we can benefit from. Some of them will be able to relate more to than others. I may be able to relate more to maybe Umar radiallahu an more than I can to maybe Abu Dhar radiallahu an. Some of you may be able to relate to Khadija radiallahu anha more than you can to Aisha radiallahu anha. Maybe you can benefit from some aspects of Aisha radiallahu anha's life, some aspects of Khadija radiallahu anha, and then some aspects of Asma radiallahu anha. The more we can learn about these individuals, the more we become enriched in our understanding. Because the reason we're here and we're listening, and we're interested is because we're Muslims. Allah has chosen us for Islam. Now, to become good Muslims, the best people we can learn our Islam from in a more practical sense, are the Sahaba. Reason is that from, for theory, we learn it from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the Qur'an and the Hadith, for example. But the way the Hadith are actually enacted, the way they are, it's personalized in a human being, you're going to get that from the Sahaba. And there are so many Sahaba to give us numerous different manifestations of what the Hadith are saying. Because when you read a Hadith, how we apply it, we may have some doubts about that. We may have some, there may be some obscurity in that regard. But when you actually see the companions in the way they did things in the light of what they had learned from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then that really helps us. That's what I found to be useful in all of this. And the reason I picked this particular individual, this particular female companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is because she has really inspired me. She's an amazing individual. Not to say the others don't, but there's just something about her that you will find. The person we're speaking about is Asma bintu Abdullah. Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr. His, Abu Bakr is his title. His name was Abdullah. Abu Quhafa, again, is a title of his father. Right. So, so anyway, um, or Ibn Uthman. That's uh, another opinion. But whatever the case is, her name is Asma, daughter of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. So she's the daughter of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. Most people must have heard about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. Her mother was uh, another Qurashi, uh, was from the Quraysh as well. And she is the sister of Aisha radiallahu anha. She's the older sister at least 10 years or more older than Aisha radiallahu anha. She had a different mother to Aisha radiallahu anha. Abu Bakr radiallahu had different wives over his, uh, over his life. And the mother of Aisha radiallahu anha, her name is Umm Ruman. 
whereas the daughter, uh, whereas the mother of uh, of Asma radiAllahu anha was was another. It was another wife. So they are half sisters. Father is the same. Now what we have to understand is that when you're looking for courage, when you're looking for chivalry, chivalry, ca- courage, valor, heroism, it's not restricted to men only. When you, when we will just go through our brief biography of Asma radiAllahu anha, you will understand that she is equivalent to hundreds of men. She is equivalent to hundreds, if not thousands of men. Right? So courage and valor and greatness doesn't discriminate between men and women. And we have to really understand that. And when you look at the Sahaba and how they shone and what they managed to achieve, then you will actually see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses people despite their gender. That's why Islam creates heroes out of men and out of women, not just out of men. You may hear about the men much more, but there may be a greater number of men, but let us not lose sight and let us not forget the women who are the heroes that Islam has created as well. So this great Sahabiyah, this great female companion of the Prophet ﷺ, you have to understand what she is. Number one, her father is a great Sahabi. Her grandfather is a Muslim, Abu Quhafa later became Muslim. Her husband was none other than the Hawari of the Prophet ﷺ, the, the special assistant, the special supporter, just like Isa alayhi salam had a number of disciples. The Prophet sallallahu said that my disciple is Zubair ibn al-Awam. That was her husband. Her son are none other than the likes of Abdullah ibn Zubair, the one who uh, became a Khalif eventually. Then she has Urwa ibn Zubair. She has a number of other sons as well. So her father, her grandfather, her husband, her sons, number of uh, at least one of her sons, they're all Sahaba. And then, inshallah, you'll understand what we're looking for. Now, I'm going to give you a few pointers as to what to look for in her story. Because this shouldn't be just a narrative. This shouldn't be just a story. This is going to be, inshallah, a lesson for us that we can all benefit, both our brothers and sisters. Because this is not just that only the sisters can benefit from this talk. This is actually for brothers as well. Because as I said, greatness and good qualities are something we can all share. The points we're going to be looking for, inshallah, to, in today's talk are number one, coping with difficulty. How does one cope with difficulty? Difficulty comes on everybody. But how does a person deal with difficulty? Number two, being revolutionary. Doing something different. Not just following the grain, but coming out of your comfort zone. Doing what somebody else, nobody else in fact does. Because it's needed and it's what's right at the time. That's being revolutionary. You're going to look out for revolutionary ideas from her. Number three, dealing with an alien environment maybe. How she deals with new environments. Contribution to conquest or da'wah, inviting others. Another aspect is faith in the time of struggle. We really need that. Muslims are going through a great struggle at this time. Many are losing their faith because they can't bother. They want to be comfortable. But there are going to be difficulties. So how is a person able to hold on to their faith at that time? Just general role in society, that's another aspect. And then of course, very specific to women, roles as mothers. Roles as females, roles as mothers. This is, uh, these are some of the things that we're going to be looking at here. One of the most famous things and most popular things that you will hear about Asma radiallahu anha whenever you do any search on her and whenever you pick up any book on her is that she's called a Dhatun Nitaqain. Nitaqain is the jewel of nitaq, two nitaqs. What's a nitaq? A nitaq is like a girdle or a belt, something that women will use to uh, basically tighten their clothing around them, a kind of a belt of some sort. So essentially a piece of cloth or some other material that is used to make a belt. So she is the, she has been called, she's known as the one with the two belts. Now why was that the case? Well, she had a piece of cloth. She had a cloth that she used to use. And on one occasion when the Prophet ﷺ was about to migrate to Medina Munawwara, there was some food uh, and supplies that were being prepared, but there was nothing to tie them into, or there was nothing to tie them up with. So what she done, she was quite young at the time. This was before the migration. She was quite young at the time. 
You can tell her intelligence from here that she immediately, she took this cloth, this sheet that she had, she tore it into two pieces, and she used one to tie up the cloth, uh, uh, that cloth. The Prophet ﷺ seemed to have been observing this, and he gave her the title, Dhatun Nitaqain, because now she had two pieces. One she used for a belt, the other one she used to tie up these supplies, this packed lunch and these other supplies for the road. And she was extremely, extremely proud of this title because the Prophet ﷺ had given her this title. When a great person gives you a title, then generally you really revel in it. So that's why she was called the Dhatun Nitaqain. That's what it means. Now, another thing that we have to understand is that despite the fact that her father's this great person, her grandfather, her husband, her son, why does it make her great? The reason it makes her great as well is not just because of where she came from and not because of these individuals only. She was great because of her iman as well. So let us not try, try to take a ride on who our father or mother is or which village we come from or which postcode we live in or which family we come from or what background we have. That's going to not help you in the akhirah at all. It's your own qualities your own iman with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's going to be of benefit. Every one of us maybe has something that they can maybe brag about. But let us not become deluded. That's maybe not our achievement. Let us not just ride on the achievements of others and think it's sufficient. We can ride on the achievements of others, but we need to make a name for ourselves for the right reason. Then we will be remembered for our own self rather than through somebody else. And that's exactly what she did. That's exactly what she did. So now what we have is, that's why there, there, there's a, a poem in Arabic which says, لا تقل, أصلي, لا تقل أصلي وفصلي أبدا إنما أصل الفتى ما قد حصل Basically don't keep saying that, oh my lineage, my ancestry, my background, I'm from this family and I'm from that family. Don't keep saying that forever. That's not going to help you. The, your real origin the real thing that you stand on, the foundations that you stand on, is what you actually achieve. That's very important. Now, Asma bint Abi Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anha, her entire life was full of iman. So from a very young age, I think she was only 14 years old when she became Muslim. That is when the Prophet sallallahu declared Islam, and her father was obviously the first man to become Muslim. Khadija radiallahu anha was the first person, and the first woman to become Muslim, but the first person as well. She became Muslim, Asma radiallahu anha became Muslim when she was only 14 years old and it looks like there were only 17 Muslims at the time, so she was probably the 18th one. So that's very early on, at that age she becomes Muslim and then her entire life seeing her father and his closeness to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it taught her a great lesson. She obviously benefited hugely from that and her life reflected her father's relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well. A very interesting incident tells us her, her intellectual acumen, her insight into matters, how she was a very practical woman who managed to deal with, with issues in a very practical way. After her father left with the Prophet wasallam, they leave for Medina Munawwara for the migration. They go secretly. Now, for that trip, Abu Bakr Siddiq pretty much took everything, all of his wealth. He took everything with him because they would need it on the way. This was all preparation. The two animals that he had, the additional supplies and everything he took with him. His father, who was a mushrik, who was a, a polytheist at the time, who was not a Muslim at the time, he says to Asma radiallahu anha after, the, after Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha has disappeared, he says that um, it looks like just as he has disappeared himself, he's also not left you any money and he's taken all of his money with him as well. And he's left you nothing. Now, Asma radiallahu anha felt that it was a great affront, especially from an Islamic perspective that this is coming, though from her grandfather, who is the father of her father, and he could be saying this in a fatherly way, but she felt that this may be coming from a mushrik, a polytheist against Islam as such. What she did is she says, no, my, my father, look, I'll show you what he's left. What she did was she went to that place in the wall that where they would generally store their coins. She went and put a number of uh, stones in there, pebbles in there. She covered it, with, covered it up with a cloth. Her grandfather couldn't see. She was blind. He, and he, she led him to this place and says, here, give me your hand. And then she made him feel around. And he says, oh, your father's left you a lot. That's good. He's left you a lot. So you can tell her intelligence right from that age. She's quite young. 
right, 14, 15 years old, but she's able to deal with these matters. And today, I mean, we get our young brothers and sisters, 14, 15 years old, 16 years old, they lose their phones and they start crying. I mean, I know phones are bad to lose, but the problem is that they flash them everywhere, then they leave them on a bus. Because I remember I lost the phone once. So the lesson I learned from it is that when I'm sitting in my car, whether as a driver or passenger, don't leave your phone on your lap. Because when you get up, it drops somewhere. It's obvious, isn't it? So keep it in your pocket. Now, a lot of us, what we do is when we're eating somewhere, whatever, we just leave our phone on the table. And that's really a bad habit, to be honest, because it's just ripe for pickpocketing. It's just ripe for stealing. So mashallah, that's, that's her state. On one occasion, she says, just after this, she was sleeping at night. And suddenly, there's a loud knock on the door. So she opened the, opened the door in the middle of the night. And you know who's standing there? Abu Jahl. One of the arch enemies, very violent individual. And he, you could tell the anger on his face because he just discovered, it looks like that the Prophet ﷺ had left, had migrated, had slipped out. Because remember, if you know the story that they had actually all congregated outside his house on that very night, coincidentally, right? That very night they had actually congregated outside to try to kill him, you know, uh, through one individual from every tribe so that the blame would be so far spread that they wouldn't be able to retaliate. But the Prophet ﷺ managed to slip out because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blinded their eyes. So he quickly burst into the house and you could tell he's very angry, asking, where's your father? She says, she, I don't know. I don't know where he is, meaning at this point I don't know where he is. So he gave a, a slap by which her, her earring fell off. She remembers that slap, that he gave her a huge slap. Finally, she also goes from Makkah Mukarramah and she also migrates, but she is heavily pregnant because by this time she has married Zubayr ibn al-Awam radiyallahu an. Zubayr ibn al-Awam radiyallahu an, the great Sahabi. Now, one thing about Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiyallahu an, let's, let's talk about, she becomes pregnant and... In that state, she's on the migration, on a camel, on a horse, whatever it was. As soon as they get to Medina Munawwara and they enter Masjid Quba, that Quba area, she gives birth. So you can tell she was heavily pregnant, just ready. And the, and the child who's born to her, his name is Abdullah. That was the first child born to the Muhajireen, the emigrators, when they reached Medina Munawwara. And they were extremely excited and happy. And the reason is that there was, I think there were some rumors going around that there's some spell, a curse has been placed on the Muhajireen, etc. that they can't have children. So when Abdullah ibn Zubayr anhu was born, there was a huge amount of happiness. She sent the child to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took this child, he, he kissed him and then he did the tahniq. You know the tahniq when you take a date, he had a date, he chewed it, softened it, put it into the child's palate, that's what you call the hanak is the palate. So he placed it by the palate and then if you do this, you'll see that the child really enjoys it because it's very sweet, right? They really enjoy it. So basically the first thing that enters into the mouth of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu is the saliva of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Now for those of you who don't understand this, that this has a great, huge spiritual connotation, right? You know, that we believe in this kind of spiritual aspect here, that the saliva of the Prophet ﷺ, the blessed saliva, it's going into his mouth first, and thus he becomes one of the greatest and bravest of the, of the Sahaba later on. So yeah, they took this baby and they were going around Medina Munawwara, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, really, really excited. Allahu Akbar, they were saying, all the way through. This Abdullah ibn Zubair, while he was still a young young. Uh, young toddler, young boy, actually young boy, not a toddler, but young boy, he was playing with some of the other students, uh, sorry, he was playing with some of the other children at the time. Why am I remembering students? Right? He was playing with some of the other children at the time, some of the other kids, and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh, passes by. Now Umar ibn al-Khattab from the beginning had an awe about him. He commanded a lot of awe. So the children all ran away except Abdullah ibn Zubayr, right? the, the son of uh, Asma radiallahu anh, anha. And he stands there, he, he kind of just looks at him, he is politely, he stands there politely, not, not in a kind of with an attitude, right? So uh, the thing of Umar radiallahu anhu is that he's interested, what's happening here? So he go, gets to him and he says, um, young boy, how come you didn't run when everybody else ran? Why didn't you run away as well? So look at the answer he gives. He says, ayyuhal amir. 
you're not an oppressor that I need to be fearful of your oppression right? and neither am I guilty for anything that I must be fearful of you punishing me I'm not guilty of anything and neither you're an oppressor and you know the path there's enough of it for both me and you for you and I there's enough road so that you, you, you can just tell where this is all coming from Urwa who is her other son Abdullah's brother his name is Urwa so Urwa ibn Zubair he says that uh, he relates from Asma radiallahu his mother. His mother said that Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu married me and he had nothing to his name. He was very poor. Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu was actually very, very poor. Except his horse and a piece of land that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gifted him, he had nothing else. So he had, in those days, you know, you had servants, you had slaves, whatever. He didn't have anything else. So we had to do all the work. So now, th this is a, a... She's saying that I used to look after this horse I used to feed this horse, I used to go and get the seeds and everything, I used to grind them and I used to get the other fodder for this horse so that I could feed this horse. She says that he, the piece of land that he had was a quite a distance away. So I used to go all the way there, pick all the seeds up and then put them on my head and I used to bring them back. And then on one of these occasions there was a very famous incident that took place. As she's coming back with this bale on her, on her head, carrying it back for him, she didn't have to do this, but this was just the husband and wife relationship. This was just the khidmat that she, she was doing. This was just the, uh, just the assistance that she was providing him. He was working elsewhere. He, she was looking after the animal. So as she goes past, there's the Prophet ﷺ there with a number of his companions. He sees her in that state. Remember, it's his sister-in-law. Because the Prophet ﷺ is married to her sister, Aisha radiallahu anha. So he says, um, ikh ikh, which means get on the animal. Right? So she remembered, I mean, there was a lot of men there, and she remembered that Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu an has a lot of uh, self-esteem, jealousy about his wife. You know, he was known for that, right? That he's very protective over his wife. So she said no, right? She said no, she refused to go and ride on the animal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left her, and, and then she went. And then she went and told this to Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu an that look, this is what happened. So he said, look, you know, you're, you're carrying this heavy weight on your head. That's actually more severe on me than you having uh, ridden the animal of the Prophet wasallam. That would have been fine, but she still refused for whatever reason to, to go on there. Eventually, though, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq an sent um, some help for them. And then after that, she says that life became easier. But you know, as the Prophet, as Allah says in the Quran, in the Ma'al Usri Yusra, these were the humble beginnings of Zubair ibn al-Awam. Now remember, he is actually one of the ten that have been given the glad tidings of paradise. Her husband is one of the ten that have been given the glad tidings of paradise, Ashara Mubashara. And among those ten, he's actually up there with Uthman radiallahu an and Zubair, uh, sorry, Abdurrahman ibn Auf as being a millionaire. A billionaire. He was extremely wealthy afterwards. right? So he eventually became extremely wealthy. So that's fine, you know, if there's tough uh, beginnings, it doesn't have to remain tough for the rest of your life. We can only obviously touch on some very salient features of her life because in the time that we have. It was during the Khilafah, uh, just one, one story that I, I do want to talk about. Remember, this is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an, the closest to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He could have pretty much had his daughter marry anybody. One of his daughter was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he could have had her, a smart radiyam, to marry to anybody he wanted. But he lets her marry this very poor man at that time, Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu an. And the reason for it is that you look for quality as opposed to just material substance. If you have quality, it will last forever. That quality will stay with a person forever. Whereas if you have wealth, not to diminish wealth in any way, not to denigrate it in any way, wealth is fleeting. You could lose it tomorrow. Or you may maintain it tomorrow. But at least if you have the quality, you have the ability then to have wealth with it as well. What's the point of wealth with no good qualities? So if there was a choice between the two, that's why there was a, a famous tabi'i, somebody who came after the Sahaba. His name was Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. Not Sa'id ibn al-Jubayr, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. He had an amazing daughter. She was a big scholar in her own right. She was one of his students. She was a huge scholar as 
she was proposed to by so many different people, including the, the prince of the time. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who later became the Khalif, after Zubair ibn al-Awam, after, sorry, after Abdullah ibn Zubair, the person who became Khalif was Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He proposed to her for his son Walid, Walid ibn Abdul Malik, who later became the Khalif, right? And he refused. He refused. On one occasion, what happened is one of his students uh, disappeared. He was a faqir student who had no money. He disappeared for two weeks. And he was wondering where his student's gone for two weeks. And suddenly when he came back, he asked, where have you been? He says, my wife passed away. My wife died. So, you know, I was taking care of her burial and everything. And uh, so he said to him, uh, are you married then? Meaning, do you have another wife? He says, no, I don't have another wife. I can't marry another wife. I don't have the money to marry another wife. So he said, okay, I'm going to marry you to my daughter. you my daughter. I'm going to marry you to my daughter. I said, whatever. Then he goes home that day. And suddenly at night time, Right, in the evening, at night time, he suddenly hears a knock on the door. So he says, who is it? He says, uh, Saeed. And he says to himself, he says later, when he's reporting this, I thought of every Saeed in the world except my teacher. Why would my teacher come to my house? That's too much of an honor. I thought of every Saeed, like which Saeed is this coming at this time of the night? So I opened the door and it's my teacher. And my, my teacher is saying to me, I brought your wife for you. I didn't want you to sleep alone tonight. That, that's just amazing. She was a sought after. She was beautiful. She was a great scholar. She had the knowledge. You know, you can say this was a woman with a PhD in the works. But he marries her to this poor student of his because their focus is something else. If your intention is inshallah to help people because medicine, you know, scholars and medics, they're very similar. Do you know that? Scholars and medics are very similar. Econ uh, economic conditions don't, don't affect scholars and uh, doctors because people still become sick, right? So they need to go to scholars for spiritual sicknesses and they need to go to medics for physical ailments. So you guys, you know, scholars and medics will always be, inshallah, in demand. And we've got more potential than engineers, than accountants to have learned huge amounts of rewards. Believe me. And the reason is that if you have the right intention, and the motivation for why you are doing medicine, then your entire study and your entire life afterwards put, could be just full of reward. If you haven't changed your intention or corrected your intention already, then you've wasted a lot of time already. And it's not too late yet. Have an intention that... Because it's one of those fields where you, can, you are individually going to be confronted by people with a need. Engineers aren't going to be as much. They have general needs sometimes, right? But a lot of their work is less, less directly related. Whereas for medics, it's directly related. So believe me, you're in a wonderful vocation as long as you do it right for the right motivation. And may Allah give us the right motivation for that. So in, in, inshallah in Jannah, you're going to get a lot of scholars and medics maybe. And others. It was during the Khilafah of her son... Abdullah ibn Zubair, after Muawiyah, after Ali radiallahu anhu, Hassan radiallahu anhu became Khalif for about six months, then Muawiyah radiallahu anhu became Khalif for several years, then his son Yazid became Khalif for some years. After he died, then the people in Medina Munawwaran in the Hijaz, they gave their bay'ah as to make Abdullah ibn Zubair, her son, to be the next Khalif of the Muslims. Right? But there was a lot of civil war during that time because they, they had the Umayyads in, in, in Damascus. You know, who didn't agree with that. And they felt that it had to continue there. So there was Marwan down there. So there were skirmishes throughout his life. But there, was, there did come a time when he had much of the Muslim world under him. But later he started losing it. When the son of Marwan took over, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And they, they, a reversal began until eventually. Until eventually what happened is that he was then confined to Makkah Mukarramah alone. Right? It was quite a bad scene at that time. It is no time to go into that. Though if you do want to listen to it, uh, I, I've covered it uh, in, what is it, the Signs of the Day of Judgment. It's under the Signs of the Day of Judgment on zamzamacademy.com. I mean, you can listen to the whole story of Abdullah ibn Zubayr there, but it's not the time for it right now. But during the time when he is the Khalifa, when he is the Khalifa and he is the ruler of the Muslim world, or at least much, most of the Muslim world, once his mother invited him over and spoke to him, 
He used to actually live with his mother. His mother, he used to actually look after his mother afterwards. Because it, it transpires that later there was a divorce that took place. An interesting story of how that happened between Asma radiallahu anha and her husband Zubair radiallahu anha, later on. So she moved in with, uh, with her son Abdullah ibn Zubair. He said, she, she told him that, look, I've heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioning that the Kaaba, which is square right now as it is today, a cube, it's actually supposed to be rectangle. And so Abdullah ibn Zubayr says that my mother Asma bint Abi Bakr, a Siddiq, has told me that the Messenger of Allah used to say to Aisha radiallahu anha, her sister, that if it wasn't that your people had just become Muslim, the Quraysh had just become Muslim, out and come out of their disbelief, you know, their state of disbelief, then I would have taken the Kaaba and made it back into the rectangular shape that it used to be. Right? Because the Kaaba before the Quraysh was, or during the time of the Quraysh was rectangular, but when they renovated it, they didn't have enough money to make it rectangular, so they made it square. And that's why they kept that semicircular wall next to it to show that that's also part of the Kaaba. But then it was just cut short. So when he found out about this, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, that's what he did. He dug up the foundations and he made it into the rectangle. He made the rectangle, he added two doors. Both on ground level, one to go in from and one to go out from. Because the reason the Quraysh had put that door higher up is because then they could regulate who go in there. Now you might be thinking is that where is all of this coming from when the Kaaba we see today is square? Right? So exactly what happened, you'll find out later, right? And I'll just tell you now that though he made it rectangular, after Hajjaj took over and had him killed, out of his spite he put it back into the square. Right. The scholars did come later to our great, uh, uh, sorry, not the scholars, but some of the later leaders, they came to Imam Malik and said, we want to make it back into the rectangle as had been the wish of the Prophet Wasallam. But he said, look, now leave it because he's already gone through all of this turmoil. Every subsequent leader who hates the previous leader is then going to make this a plaything and a demonstration or manifestation of his power and thus keep changing it. So just leave it now. So we're stuck with it as it is right now. Right? Though the Prophet ﷺ wanted it back into the rectangular extended shape as Ibrahim ﷺ had originally made it rectangular. Now what happens is it's just some moments or some, some time before, the, before Abdullah ibn Zubayr is finally, finally martyred. He goes to visit his mother. He goes to visit his mother. She was by this time over a hundred years old, extremely old over a hundred years old, and she, it says that she couldn't see at that time. Maybe she had cataracts or something, but she'd lost her eyesight by that time. She still had all of her teeth though, but she'd lost her eyesight. So he said, As-salamu alayka ya umma wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you, O my mother, and Allah's mercy and His blessing. She says, Wa alayka salam ya Abdullah. He said, she said to him, what brings you at this time? There are all of these massive bombs that are falling on Makkah. And he was supposed to be defending that because it's his Khilafah. And they, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf has been sent against him to finally finish him off there. He said, all of this attack is taking place on Makkah Mukarram. And at this time you come to see me, what is going on? I've come to ask you for your opinion about something, some advice on something. What are you going to ask me about? What advice are you going to ask me? said, look, people have, people have humiliated me. And a lot of my supporters, they've left me. They've left me out, either out of fear for Hajjaj and what he will do to them, or out of, out of greed for what they've promised. Because, you know, people who are being either bribed or whatever the case is to leave his side. So much so that even some of my own family, some of my own children have turned away from me, he says. And they've run away from me. I've only got a small band of men with me that remain with me. But the problem is that they are so tired and weary from the constant battle that at any moment they, they, can't, they, they, don't have, they don't have the same ability to withstand this as they did before. And also, now there's another proposal that has come up. And the proposal is that the Banu Umayyah, the Umayyads who are fighting against him, they've sent me a proposal. And they've told me that they're willing to give me whatever I want. Anything of the dunya, anything of the world, whatever worldly possession I ask for and I demand from them, they're willing to give it to me as long as I put down my weapons and I give the beta, the pledge, 
the Pledge of Allegiance to Abdullah, uh, sorry, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the, the one they'd given bayah to on the other side. What do you think I should do? What do you think? What do, what's your feeling? She, suddenly her voice became raised and she said, Sha'nuk ya, ya Abdullah, it's up to you. Abdullah, it's up to you. You, you, you know your story better. Wa anta a'lamu bi nafsik. If you believe that you are on the truth, listen to these words carefully. This is a mother who is speaking to a son who is about to be killed. She knows he's going to go very soon if he carries on the way he, you know, in his mission. And she is over a hundred years old and she's speaking and she says, if you are on the truth and you have been inviting to the truth, then be patient and persevere. Just as your companions have, have persevered, those who've already been killed in the path, those who've already been martyred in the path, under your banner, they've gone for a cause, you need to also be patient for that cause. And if you feel, if you feel that you want the world now, you want the world now, then what a evil, what a evil person you are what an evil person you are, then you have destroyed yourself. And you have destroyed your own people as well. They have fought in vain. You've destroyed them. So then he turned to her and he says, la Today I'm going to die regardless. I'm definitely going to die today. Because it was a small band of people and that was it. He said, I'm going to be dead. So then she says to him, That is actually better for you than you give yourself up to Hajjaj willingly. So then you allow your head to be played with by the young children of the Banu Umayyah, of the Umayyah. They'll cut your head off because they were known to cut people's heads off and play with it. Right? He says, she says, That's what's going to happen. So he said, Lastu akshal qatl. I don't have a fear for death. I'm not fearing the death. But I fear that they're going to mutilate my body. That's the fear that I have. She said, you know what she said at that? What is a mother going to say at that? She said, لَيْسَ بَعْدَ الْقَتْلِ مَا يَخَافُهُ الْمَرْءِ After you die, there should be nothing that you fear. For even a slaughtered sheep, a slaughtered goat, it, skinning it doesn't harm it anymore, doesn't hurt it anymore. It doesn't feel the pain of its skinning. Suddenly his face lit up. It says that the lines of his face suddenly lit, lit up and he said to her, Burikta min ummin. What a blessed mother you are. What a blessed mother you are. He's basically saying, this is exactly what uh, I wanted to hear from you. Burikta manaqibaka al jaliya. Your great excellences, may they be blessed for you. I only came to you today at this moment so I can hear from you what I have just heard. This is exactly what I've come to hear from you. By Allah, by Allah, only He knows that I have not become weak and I have not become cowardly. He is a witness. He is a witness that I did not embark upon what I embarked upon. This entire mission, this entire movement, for the love of this dunya or for its adornments. It was purely for the sake of Allah. It was purely for the sake of Allah because His limits were being violated by these people. And here I am, I am going to continue on to that which you are pleased with. If I am to die today, then do not grieve over me. Do not grieve over me and consign my matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's talking to his mother. People have a special relationship with their mothers. And she said to him, I would only grieve over you if you had died for falsehood. I would only grieve over you if I had died for falsehood. And then he said, please be fully confident, have full trust that your son has never, listen to this, he's saying that to her that make, sh make sure that you understand very clearly and be in, complete, um, be in complete confidence that your son has never purposely done any wrong. He has never purposely committed any indecency he has never committed any indecency he has never oppressed anybody and neither has he been treacherous to anybody he has never purposely oppressed any muslim or even a non-muslim muslim wala mu'ahid and there is nothing according to him which is more pleasing than the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I am not saying this, he says, I am not saying this to you to purify myself, 
to my show myself as being great. But why am I saying this to you? He says, because Allah knows me better than I know myself. The reason I'm saying this is because I want to give you condolence. I want to show you, I want to, I want to just give you some condolence that your son is not dying in vain and you, were, and you had a good son. I'm just really focused on you, she's, he's saying. She said, Alhamdulillah, all praises to Allah who made you according to his, his, his wishes and according to my wishes. And then after that, she's, she comes behind him. She comes behind him to her son Abdullah ibn Zubayr and she says, come closer to me. She says, come closer to me so that I may smell your fragrance, your odor, and I may hold your body. Because this may be our last meeting. This may be our last meeting, so let me just hold on to you for a while. So Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he went down to where she was sitting. Uh, her arms, her feet, he started kissing them. And... She was holding on to him. Suddenly, it looked like she was feeling his body and she moved her hand away. And she says, what is this I see you wearing, Abdullah? Oh, that's my, that's my armor. And she said, لَيْسَ هَذَا يَا بَنِي لِبَاسْ مَنْ يُرِيدَ الشَّهَادَةِ This isn't the garments of the one who wants to be martyred. This isn't the garments of the one who wants to be martyred. So you know what he says to her? He says that I only wore this to make you feel good. To give you some comfort. That's why I had worn it in the first place. To give you some comfort and to calm down and satisfy your heart. She said, take it off you. She said, take it off you. Because if you take it off, you'll be able to move faster. You'll be more lighter on your feet. And that is what's going to help you. However, do wear, he said, do wear, a double trousers do wear a double pant and the reason for that is when you do become overcome when they do overcome you at least you will not become denuded that's the main thing so Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu immediately took off his armor and he put on the double his the double pants on him and then he went and he said to her make dua for me so she started to make dua for him she said she raised her hands to the heavens and she said, Oh Allah, have mercy on his lengthy standing in, in front of you. His lengthy standing in front of you. The intensity of his crying in the darkness of, of darknesses of night when other people are sleeping. Oh Allah, I have consigned his, him to you. I am satisfied with whatever you are satisfied with for him. O oh Allah, give me the reward of those who are patient. And O oh Allah, have mercy on his obedience, on his being obedient to his mother and father. I am satisfied with whatever you're satisfied with. That day the sun did not set except that Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu went and joined his Lord and it was only about 14 days or so later that she eventually leaves this world as well. She passes away as well. She goes to Makkah Mukarramah where her son was. Now remember he'd been, his head has been cut off or uh, uh, he, sorry, he'd been killed and then he'd been hung. And there was nobody brave enough to go and take him down. There was nobody brave enough to go and take him down. When Asma radiallahu anha got there, she couldn't see properly. Hajjaj, who was in Makkah at the time, he sent somebody to bring her to him. She refused to go. He sent another person saying that if you don't come, I'm going to send some people to you to grab you by the forelocks. To grab you by the forelocks and drag you to me. You can see he's, he's an extremely violent guy. Extremely violent guy. No respect for anybody. So she refused. He says, I'm, by Allah, I'm not going to come to you even if you call, even if you send somebody to drag me to you. Finally, Hajjaj came to her. She, he came and he says, What do you think I've done with the enemy of Allah? What do you think I've just done with the enemy of Allah? Referring to her son. 
So the mother, Asma radiallahu anha, says that what I have seen is that you have destroyed his dunya for him. You've just killed him in this world, so you've destroyed his dunya, his world. But he has destroyed your akhirah. He has destroyed your other world, your next world. It's reached me that you say, you said to him that you're the son of the one with the two belts as a denigration. He, he, he had been saying that in a mocking way. I've heard, so she's addressing him saying that, I've heard that you've been saying that to my son. I am by Allah, I am that dhatun nitaqeen. As far as one of them, I used to t- I tied with it the food and the supplies of the Prophet wasallam, And the other one, I used it for what women use it for. So what's the problem with that? But all I know, and she gives him back as much as she gets, even at this age. She says, you know what? I have heard that the Prophet wasallam has said that among the Banu Thaqif, which was his tribe, Hajjaj's tribe was a Thaqif. He says, among the Banu Thaqif will come two people. From them will come two people. One will be the imposter who will claim prophecy. And the other one is going to be this destructive person. Very destructive person. As far as the imposter, we've all seen him. Referring to Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, who passed before. And as far as this destructive person is concerned, I have no doubt that it's you. This is after all the warnings he had given her. Hajjaj... At that time, he didn't respond to her, he went away. Now, eventually, there's a, another exchange that took place. And in that case, uh, it was something similar. But finally, the words reached the Khalif, who was Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Obviously, for him, the Hajjaj is the one who had actually put everything in order for him. So he probably appreciated him for that. But he was unhappy of the way he addressed Asma radiallahu anha. So he said, Malak walibnati rajuli salih. What's your problem? Why do you have the, why are you acting this way with the daughter of a really righteous man, Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an? And then he ordered him that he should take down Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu an from the wooden post that he was on. So then finally Asma radiallahu anha was the only one who was he lay there for a while. It was only Asma radiallahu anha at her age who then went, maybe with the help of others, who went and took the body and bathed it, shrouded it, perfumed it, and then prayed upon it, and then had him buried. And then after a few days, she passed away. In fact, on, it, it may have been the same occasion, when he came to Asma radiallahu and he says, Ya Ummah, O Mother, just out of maybe showing some kind of respect, in the Amir al-Mu'mini wasani bik, because you know, after Abdul Malik ibn Marwan told her that you must deal with her properly, so I think he must have come again, and this time he said, O Mother, out of respect, the Amir al Mu'minin has told me to treat you well. Fahallaki min haja, do you have any need? Is there anything I can do for you? And you know what she says? Lastu laki um. Lastu laka um. I'm not a mother of yours. I'm not your mother. But I am the mother of the one who has been crucified on that wooden post. And I have no need from you. But I will tell you. And then she mentioned that statement that the Prophet has mentioned the two things. It mentions in a, on another occasion that Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, the great Sahabi, he was told that Asma radiallahu anha is in the corner of the masjid. This was when Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu had been, had been hung and Asma radiallahu anha was there. So this is Abdullah ibn Umar. He came to her to maybe give her some condolence, maybe just calm her down. And he said to her that, look, the souls are all by Allah. While he may have been killed, the souls are all by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just fear Allah and be patient. Fear Allah and just persevere through this difficulty. And she says, What is going to prevent me from persevering? She said that before me, the John, Yahya alayhi salam, the son of Zakaria alayhi salam, his head was cut off and was given to a prostitute of that time an unchaste woman of that time. So why, what, what should prevent me from being patient when they were patient at that time? She was just too much in tune with, the, with our heritage. She knew exactly what to do. She didn't lose her mind in, in, any of these, in any of these situations. Now what happens is, she passes away, but just a few things that are known about her I'd like to mention about some of her excellences. It's about her that it's related that her mother came to visit her. Her mother was not a Muslim. Right? Her mother was not a Muslim at that time at least. 
When she came to visit, she said, hold on, I need to go and find out whether I can interact with you, whether I can still have the same relationship with you. So she went to the Prophet and she said, my mother's come, can I have the same relationship? He says, yes, of course, she's your mother. For, uh, sil, you know, go, go, and, go and tie the knots of kinship with her. Qasim ibn Muhammad says that he heard Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu saying that there are, I've not seen, uh, uh, I, there are two women, he's talking about his, his mother and his aunt. Uh, he's talking about Aisha the young Asma. He says, I haven't seen any woman, any women who are more generous than those two women. The only difference in their generosity is that Asma radiallahu, Aisha radiallahu anha, when she used to get her supplies, you know, whatever was given to her, her yearly supplies and everything, she would gather whatever bits she had together until she had enough and then she would go and give it out to the poor. Whereas Asma radiallahu anha, her focus was totally different. Whatever she got, she would give out. She wouldn't even wait to gather it together. And she would, tell, she would actually tell her, uh, the women folk and everybody in the house to do the same. She would, she would, just, she would just give everything out. She died uh, after, uh, a few nights after her son had passed away. This was about the 17th of Jumad al-Ula in the year 73 Hijri. 73 Hijri, the same year as her son. And you can tell from her the, the various different excellences the various different merits, the various different uh, qualities that we, we get from her, which is extreme intelligence, being a very reasonable woman, being very quick to make decisions and judgments, extremely courageous, not fearful at all, even at that old age. Look at the interaction that she has with her, with her son. And also look at the service that she provided to her husband by going all of those miles and picking up everything. So she was an all-rounder. She's not just some intellect, you know, you get some people who are just very intellectual and they're very good in laboratories. They're very good in their academic setting and so on. But when they go home, they have no idea how to interact with anybody, right? And you have some people who are very good with everybody, but they're not very intellectual. She had everything. She was very intellectual, but such a decent person of character and willing to serve others as well. She left uh, a number of children. Her children were Asim, Muhajir, Urwa, Mundhir, Khadija, Khadija al-Kubra, and uh, Ummul Hassan and Aisha. These were, these were her children. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from the great qualities that we have just heard of Asma radiallahu. May Allah grant her greatness in where she is right now and where she will go in the hereafter. May Allah grant her the greatest places in Jannatul Firdaus and her entire family. And may Allah allow us to be inspired and may Allah allow us to also be like these people and to have in our families people like this and to be truthful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the way she was. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ she got divorced, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to prolong the story because sometimes I get into all of these side points. So what, what it is, is that there's about three opinions as to exactly what happened, but it was actually because of Abdullah ibn Zubair that she got divorced. Now you have to remember that in those days, divorce was quite easy, right? It didn't hold the stigma that it did today, right? So let's just base it on that. Uh, I'm sure he must have had other wives as well, I wouldn't be surprised. Abdullah, uh, sorry, Zubair ibn Awam. So what happened is, there's a number of stories, but one of them is that they had an argument. And Abdullah, meaning the husband and wife, had an argument. And Abdullah is there, and uh, Zubair Radiyan tells his son, if you come in here, your mother's going to be divorced. Right? If you come inside the room, your mother's divorced, you stay out of it. But he came in. Right? He came in, so she got divorced. Uh, so then she moved in with Abdullah ibn Zubair. Uh, what is important here is that don't get carried away with your, the normal trend of what everybody else is doing. Unfortunately, what's happening, and I've seen this more in America than I've seen here, but I'm sure it's happening here now as well, which is that everybody is, is basically saying that, look, my son's doing this. So then suddenly you feel that your son and daughter must do the same thing. Oh, my son's going to Imperial. My daughter's got into Imperial. Where have your son got into? Where's your daughter got into? So and suddenly everybody wants a My son's becoming a doctor, right? A doctor. So everybody feels that then they have to do that as well. It, you just have to really understand what is, the, what is the focus and what really ultimately matters. Don't get stuck. Don't get, don't get stuck in 
the adornments of what everybody else is doing. Have your own principles. Let these people be your guiding lights. So really what I want to do is I want to ask at least two or three of you what you found to be the most salient feature that has somehow, inshallah, impacted you. Right? So we've, we've had this point that you've brought up. Right? Um, can we have another point from this side um, of something that you think uh, that you can resonate with or that hopefully will help to, to clarify and, and to, to uh, uh, improve your understanding or maybe change your understanding and perspective maybe? Can, can we have somebody? Yes. Yeah, you see, I, I didn't think of it from that perspective. That's actually a very important perspective that we are very quick to keep blaming our parents because we are, what, what is the generation we called? The, the complaining generation or something where we just complain about everything, right? So to appreciate your parents for what they have given us and even to defend them in things that we don't, at least to keep your, like you're not going to go to school and start telling them, my dad doesn't buy me that stuff, you know, my, my parents are like this, my parents are like that. That's probably the vilest thing that you can do to put your parents down in front of others. I used to defend my parents, I didn't have much, you know, my spending money was very small when I was young. I used to get, uh, even in Madras, I used to get one pound a, a week. And we used to go out the next day and I used to, packet of chips with 70 pence, couldn't even buy a fish with it, right? Seriously, it was about one pound fifty for a fish and chips in those days up north, right? So I used to get a pound. I used to finish it on Saturday, and then after that, I had no money for the rest of the week. But I never once complained to anybody. And I remember once one of my teachers he said, "Read Surah Al-Muzammil, and you will get barakah in your wealth." And I started reading it. The next week, I got a job in the madrasa. I got seven pounds a week. One pound to seven pounds, which is a lot of money in those days. And since that day, I've never looked back. Anything I've wanted, Allah has given me. Right? So at the end of the day, if you have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I don't even have much trust, you just put a bit of trust in Allah, Allah will start giving you. So yeah, never denigrate your parents. Never denigrate your parents. That's a very good point. Another point. She, she had a lot of guts. I mean, the fact that even when she's pregnant, she undertakes that journey. Right? You can tell she's got a lot of guts. You know, we only covered a bit of a life. We, we couldn't cover too much more. Just some of the salient features. But to say that that exchange with her son was just amazing. You know, to, to focus on what's right in that context. Right? We're, we're, not, you know, we're not saying by this story that you must tell your children to go out on war or something. Right? Don't get that wrong. It's just that, unfortunately in that time, there was just a lot of blood that was being spilled. And these stories just include some of that. But we need to take the wisdom from there and apply it to our situation. Because we need a lot more people with that kind of fortitude, inshallah. And the other thing that you realize is that today we've got crazy stuff going on in Saudi and other places. May Allah protect us. And may Allah protect the Muslim world because you can see some of the movements that are taking place. But listening to this today, doesn't it tell you that we've already encountered these things before? In the heartlands, in Makkah Mukarramah, it was being attacked. They were attack attacking it with huge catapults. Right, to get Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu out of it. So all of this has happened before. This is not unprecedented. And none of this should actually cause us to lose our faith. We've had ups and downs. Jazakallah khair. Allah bless you. Allah bless all of us. And uh, those, whatever you're doing, may Allah give you the tawfiq and us the tawfiq to do something for his sake, whatever we're doing. Allah accept us for the service of his deen. He knows best how to do that. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.